be seated, my brothers and sisters. Well, happy Easter to all of you. Happy Easter, Father. No, Easter Sunday is the Feast of Feasts, the Solemnities of Solemnities. And last night, we had a glorious vigil Easter, the most important night of the entire year. You know, these last two years, it seemed like, or maybe three, it seemed like the virus had like stolen Easter. But last night, we had lots of baptisms, 20 baptisms full immersion in the pool of water. It was so much fun. Last night, we had lots of people who were confirmed and filled with the anointing of the Holy Spirit and lots of first communions. And, and I praise God. There was a big party in heaven last night. I think this, this was the best party in town last night, right here. The best party in San Pedro was right here. Now, the world today is full of Easter hope because of that. Yes, last night began in total darkness. Everything was dark. We turned off the lights outside. We had a fire outside. But the darkness represented all darkness. The darkness represented every lie, every deception, every betrayal, every infidelity, all abuse, everything that is moral, all vice, all sin. The darkness represents the kingdom of Satan. It represents the darkness of our world, and it is dark. The darkness in our own family, perhaps even in our own heart and soul. In one word, the darkness represents death. But last night, we lit the Paschal candle, the Easter candle, right here in front of the altar. The question is, does the Paschal candle represent Jesus dead or Jesus resurrected? Represents Jesus resurrected, right? This morning, I'm here to proclaim to you that Jesus Christ is alive. He is risen from the dead. Truly, Jesus is risen. He has overcome death. He has overcome the darkness. He is living again just like he promised. And all this was made possible because, one very, because of one very important fact. The tomb is empty. Do me a favor. Please tell the person next to you. The tomb is empty. I hope you didn't come here to mourn a dead man. You know, some churches seem more like a funeral home, a bunch of people all sad with long faces, like a funeral wake. Today we are not at the wake of a dead man. We are celebrating the victory of Jesus Christ over the power of sin and darkness, over the power of death itself. Jesus truly is risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yet, what evidence of the physical resurrection of Jesus do we have? You know, I've been personally to Jerusalem seven times, and I'd like to attest that the tomb is empty. I saw it. Now, you don't have to believe me, okay? But let's go now to the testimony of the New Testament, which is historically a very accurate document. The apostles believed Believe the resurrection because they physically saw him and touched him. For example, let's go to the first reading. Acts chapter 10, verse 31, 39 to 41. It says this. We are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. This man God raised on the third day and granted that he be visible, not to all people, but to us, the witnesses chosen by God in advance, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So these are powerful words. I mean, they killed Jesus, but then it says, but God raised them on the third day. Apparently, Satan beat Jesus. He won. Satan won. But God then raised, but God raised them on the third day. Apparently, Jesus was a failure. But God raised them on the third day. In other words, God can change any situation of failure in your life into a, into a situation of victory in your life. Yet it, it was pretty easy for them to believe. I mean, they actually saw and touched him. They even ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. But blessed are the billions of people that today believe. Blessed are you who believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead, not because you physically saw or touched him, because, but because you see and touch him through the eyes and the grace of faith, through faith. Now, for those of us who wish a little bit more scientific proof of the resurrection, I decided to focus this morning a little bit on the Shroud of Turin. 
I'm never sure if you've ever heard of that. This is a photocopy of the Shroud of Turin right here in front of you. You, you can look at the outline of Jesus' body. It was the burial cloth that was literally wrapped around his body. You can see the outline of Jesus' dead body. The front of his body is right here, hanging from the left column, your left column. And then the back of his body is right over there from the right column. I've done a lot of research on that. In the 1980s, some scientists tried to disprove it using radiocarbon dating, but the results have been proved to be mistaken. All it proved was that it was in a fire in the 14th century, which is a historical fact. Now, you don't have to believe it, but I personally believe it is, that it really is this a copy of the shroud that Jesus was buried in. Scientists have estimated that for this image to be literally imprinted in the burial cloth, I mean, there's no photographic technology way back when. It had to have, it, it's required an intense burst of light of about 34,000 billion watts that lasted about a millisecond, just like poof, this huge explosion of light that radiated from his entire body from the inside out because he was wrapped it's like it radiated it outward it was like a second big bang an explosion of a millisecond of light so the resurrection of jesus was the beginning you could say of a new creation a new second big bang that is bursting forth in the midst of the old creation that takes place for us in our soul yet the resurrection was not just historical event it is also a contemporary reality today one of the biggest signs that jesus was resurrected is if we his disciples have been spiritually raised to, with him to a new life of grace because it's going to be hard for some people to believe that jesus rose from the dead if all of us his disciples are spiritually dead so turn with me to the second reading from St. Paul's letter to the Colossians. We're going to go to chapter 3, and we're going to begin verse 1. It says this, Brothers and sisters, if then you were raised with Christ, seek what is above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Think of what is above, not of what is on earth. So let's stop there for a moment. What in the world is St. Paul talking about? You know, if you were raised with Christ. What is he talking about? What does he mean by, by saying, seek what is above? Well, it means that everything we do must be done in a new way. It must be done from the perspective, from the background of eternity. Everything we see must be seen against the background of eternity. Seek what of, uh, above means to seek the value of giving before getting. Seek serving above ruling. Seek forgiving above avenging. Seek what is above means our, that our habits and our character must be different. Seek character above comfort. Seek commitment above convenience. Seek availability above some self-centeredness. Seek compassion about indifference. Seek decisiveness above procrastination. Seek diligence above laziness. The list of virtues is long. Seek generosity above stinginess. Seek humility above pride. Seek loyalty above unfaithfulness. Seek sincerity above hypocrisy. In other words, seek Christ above all things. But St. Paul wrote, if, if then, a conditional statement, you were raised with Christ, seek what is above. So the condition is, have you been raised with Christ? That's the condition. But maybe some of you are thinking, oh, Father, if you only knew the problems I got, you wouldn't be screaming hallelujah, you, you, you'd be crying with me. And I say, you know what? If you got problems, then I'm so happy that you are here visiting us today. And the gospel message has a special message for you. So let's go to the gospel today. Today I chose Luke chapter 24, verse 1 through 12, where several women went to the tomb in order to embalm Jesus' body with spices. They were looking for a dead man. But they found two angels that told them, why are you looking for the dead among the living? He is not here. He is risen. 
So please repeat those words after me. He is not here. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. That's what it means to live a new life in Christ. Let me give you some practical examples. No, there was a teenager, and every morning her mom had to chew her out. Wake up! Wake up, you lazy! You're gonna be late for school again. Clean up your room. It looks like a pig pen. Might sound familiar to some of you, but this Easter, teenager sets the alarm, wakes up early, takes a shower, gets dressed for school, starts praying, cleans her room, you know. And that morning, the mother comes in as usual, sort of screaming, "Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Wake!" wake. Suddenly, she looks around. The mom's jaw sort of drops open, and the mom sees everything in its place. And her daughter already took a shower, dressed ready for school. She's asking. She's actually praying, and the mom says, "Where is my daughter? What have you done to her?" And the daughter responds, "Why do you look for the de- you know the living amongst the dead? She is not here. She is risen. That lazy daughter you had is not here. She is risen." And the mother was, "Hallelujah!" That teenager was raised with Christ this Easter. Another example. Hard-working man, and he had a wife, and they were always fighting. Any little thing was a big fight, huge fight. One day there was like some problem at work, and he realized he's going to be two hours late for dinner with his wife that she had prepared for him. And the man, the man began to think, "Oh no, here we go again. My wife is going to be upset. I know she's going to make a big fuss about this." And he started preparing himself psychologically for another big fight with his wife. But finally, he arrives home. Two hours late, opens the door, finds the table served. Wife comes up, kisses him, says, "Please sit down, my love. You must be tired, working hard all day. Let me heat, let me heat up the dinner for you." That man, that man started looking around. I must be in the wrong home. <laughs> He asks, "Where is my wife? What have you done with her?" She says, "No, my love, this is your home. But why do you seek the living among the dead? The wife that you are looking for is not here. She is risen." So, what do you think the man began to say? "Hallelujah! My wife is risen from the dead." Now, I could be here giving you a bunch of different examples like this, but but this Easter, it's your turn. The next examples need to be given by you with your life. Now you might be thinking, Father, nothing has changed in my life. It's like no new life in me. It's the same old, same old. That means that this Lent, nothing really died in you. For something to rise, it first has to die. Those in baptism, we actually have a black cross painted right in the tub. And I was telling them, you are dying with Jesus when you go into the water. You rise with Him. But you know what? If nothing has changed, if nothing has died, don't worry. Fifty days we celebrate Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. So these next fifty days, ask the Holy Spirit to bring what is sin in you to death, and ask the Holy Spirit to bring new life to you. Okay. What is this? It's an Easter egg, right? In Spanish, it's called cascarón. It symbolically, what does the Easter egg represent? I present to you the tomb of Jesus. Now the stuff inside, candy. Okay, what does that represent? It represents the sweet life of Jesus risen from the dead. No, the sweetness of Jesus. Now, the empty egg, of course. What does that represent? Well, the empty tomb, right? Because Jesus rose from the dead, and you know what? The empty egg also represents your tomb. Yep, represents your tomb. It would be interesting to think what epithet our your family will place on your tomb. Did you ever think about that? Hmm. I hope it's not like the epithet of a tombstone of a mother-in-law that I heard of. Here, my mother-in-law rests in peace, and at home, everyone rests in peace. <laughs> <laughs> in today's gospel, there is one thing 
that Jesus left behind in the empty tomb. Remember Peter saw it? It was the burial shroud right there, right before it. That's the one thing Jesus left in the tomb. Jesus left an incredible image of his dead body. Jesus left in the tomb 120 wounds from the scourging. He left in the tomb around 50 wounds on his head from the, from the crown. He left in the tomb a wound that reached all the way to his heart. So the question is, in your tomb, what wounds do you need to leave behind? What do you need to leave behind? Think about it. To be raised with Jesus, what things in your life do you need to leave in the tomb forever? My dear brother and sisters, the church is the community of believers that Jesus has overcome the power of death itself. Hope is alive because our Lord is risen. Truly, he is risen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Let's give our Lord a hand, please.